Uh, right. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, at a different time and sort of different place than we would normally meet, it's nice to see uh, so many people here, actually, uh, given that. And with the speaker we have, that's actually really no surprise. Uh, it's uh, a real honor and a privilege uh, to introduce, introduce to you Professor Andrew Lambert, who is a Lawton Professor of uh, Naval History at King's College London. Uh, he's written more books than I could possibly list off uh, in just a few quick minutes. Uh, a few years ago, The Challenge, Britain Against America in the Naval War of 1812. Uh, more recently, a book on Crusoe's Island. Uh, there's an excellent uh, book chapter on this subject in a book that uh, I expect all of you to buy called The Greater War. Um, with a good editing team. Uh, his latest work uh, is on uh, Julian Corbett uh, and is a, a new biography of him, uh, of course, as a naval thinker. Uh, so please, if you would, uh, Professor Andrew Lambert. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you to the committee for inviting me. What I want to talk about today is a book, hence there are no pictures. I thought you mostly knew what books looked like. Uh, the Corbett book is, is about yay thick, and it's, it's blue, like most naval history books, and it has some charts in it. During Corbett's naval operations, which is the official history, not just of British naval operations in the First World War, but also of British grand strategy, uh, was dominated by the need to understand and promulgate national strategic doctrine. Uh, this had been Corbett's career since the early 1900s, when he began working on the Royal Navy's war course, one of the ancestors of the current Joint Services College, not too far from here. He had analyzed historically the evolution of British strategy across centuries, and in 1911, he published some principles of maritime strategy in which he encapsulated all of that as a doctrine primer. This is the grand strategic doctrine of the British Empire at the Edwardian zenith. Uh, not only was this text an important and enduring text, but it was read and signed off by the first Sea Lord and the Chief of the Admiralty Staff before Corbett even took it to his publisher. This is quasi-official national strategic doctrine. It is not the, the clever thoughts of a clever man writing in a garret. This is a man who is teaching the Navy month in, month out, and is critically involved in the development of war planning and position papers before the First World War. The problem was that his work so far had charted the upward course of British strategy as it became more powerful, more sophisticated, as the integration between land and sea led to a maritime strategy, not a naval or a land strategy, but a maritime strategy in which all the strength of the state focused in on securing sea control and using that sea control as a tool to defeat larger and more powerful land-based polities, notably Bourbon and Bonapartist France. This trajectory and his agendas forced him to reconcile the ghastly reality of what was happening as he began writing this book and what had happened by the time he finished his part of it uh, with pre-war expectations, which down to August 1914 were that the British would repeat the experience of the previous Great War. They would hold off the continent they would use their military force for limited maritime intervention to secure and enhance their control of the sea and not to take any part in the large-scale frontal so-called decisive battles. Corbett's contribution has been seriously underrated by historians, uh, largely, I think, because they haven't read a lot of the evidence and they haven't read the book particularly well either. In his deservedly famous 1960s study of the Fisher era, Arthur Marder ignored the strategic dimension of Corbett's work and his didactic agenda. He underrated Corbett's influence on the Navy because as a fine American, he f absolutely did not understand how the Royal Navy and British society worked, uh, nor did he see that Corbett is one of the architects of national strategy. And eventually, in order to sell his own book, he discounted what he I quote, his detailed authoritative restrained judgments as a semi-popular treatment aimed at the public. Um, this is arrant nonsense. Um, Marta assumed that the real official history were the staff histories written by naval officers. Uh, these, in fact, were contr contributions to Corbett's history. They were not uh, in any way uh, 
meant to supplant it. Several of those staff histories appeared in a public form, and the editors of them were all the men who had written them for Corbett's use during the war. Uh, famously, the uh, nun's account of the gunboat operations on the Tigris and Euphrates, uh, which was published long after Corbett died, uh, the manuscript was in Corbett's hands during the writing of this history. Corbett was writing national strategic doctrine. He was certainly not engaged in the writing of tactical doctrine, a subject on which an Edwardian legal gentleman uh, was as ill-equipped to write as I am. And he knew his limitations. He never attempted to teach the Navy how to fight battles. He attempted to teach it to think strategically. Uh, and I would argue he was more successful than people have understood. Between 1902 and 1914, he taught every single significant naval officer of the First World War, with the exception of John Jellicoe, who happened to be a close personal friend anyway. He knew everybody. He knew all of the first sea lords of the First World War on uh, very close terms, and all of them lent him their personal correspondence. Uh, this was a man with a tremendous amount of access. What Corbett hoped to record in August 1914 was the successful application of classic British limited maritime strategy conducted by the two services working harmoniously under the direction of a superior strategic intelligence, something like the Earl of Chatham. Chatham was his model of statesmanship. Uh, the Seven Years' War was his model of how Britain should fight, and anything that didn't work in that way was clearly an aberration, and it needed to be explained in order to preserve the core of British doctrine uh, from the overwhelming tide of sacrifice on the Western Front, which some people mistakenly believed uh, reflected a new strategic reality. So Corbett arranges his operational tactical narrative around a politico-strategic core that integrated operations into the higher direction of war, where civilian government, allied diplomacy, and enemy policy interacted with a critical focus on the civil-military interface. This is the, the key point where he's operating. How is this relationship, how does it work, and what quality does it have? His sources for this discussion were strikingly rich. He was remarkably close to Morris Hankey, uh, who shared many of his views on maritime strategy uh, until he realized that they weren't popular. Uh, Corbett wrote a large number of Hankey's better state papers throughout the war. And his knighthood of 1917 was awarded for writing a document on the conduct of cabinet government in wartime, which Asquith used to defend his handling of the war in 1916. It was not for being a naval historian. I don't think anybody ever gets knighted for that. <laughs> <laughs> he also was closely connected with the Admiralty Secretariat, uh, with whom he shared the leadership of the Critical Navy Records Society, which published naval historical material for the development of strategic operational and tactical thinking by the Navy. He had access to the papers of the Dardanelles Commission. Ian Hamilton was another close personal friend and fellow huntsman. Uh, not that you're allowed to do that anymore. Uh, Hamilton lent him his diaries in exchange for Corbett correcting them on points of detail. Uh, he was quite close to Roger Keyes, who lent him all of the letters that Keyes later <coughs> published in his memoirs. He worked very closely with Reginald Tyrwhitt and possessed an inside track to the War Cabinet through Hankey. So his insights on the high command are close and personal. The liberal politicians who were leading the war effort were all personal friends. His brother was an MP, and he, of course, had been a pre-war coefficient in the Webb's debating society and was very close to Haldane and Gray. Uh, Haldane's letter to him after receiving a copy of his book about the Seven Years' War is a striking document and tells us a great deal about what the British Army was intended to do before the war. After the war, Corbett's work would be contested uh, by several critics, the most important of whom were Winston Churchill, who criticized volume one, and later David Beatty, who criticized volume three. Both tried to block or deflect Corbett's criticism of their manifest and blatant failings, and they both failed. Corbett saw them off remarkably effectively. His previous biographer, Professor Donald Sherman, a Canadian service educator underestimated Corbett's resolve, determination, and above all, his success. Neither Churchill nor Beatty could prevent his pub version of events reaching the public as the first officially sanctioned account of this part of the war. When Admiral Sir Archibald Barclay Milne publicly contested Corbett's account of the escape of the battlecruiser Goban 
with a book of 1920, he was roundly condemned by the mainstream press, which universally upheld Corbett's magisterial judgments. It was not a wise man who picked a public argument with Corbett. Uh, even Punch decided that he was the man to sort out which admiral had done which. In April 1913, Corbett had explained his concept of an official history to an audience of international academic historians and British naval officers at the Royal United Services Institution. He'd secured the venue as part of the International Historical Congress because both the War Office and the Admiralty men could get there in about three minutes. The meeting was chaired by the first Sea Lord. Corbett's paper was chaired by Sir William Robertson, who might not have liked what he heard. Corbett, Corbett reflected on his experience of using official histories, and he was then writing a confidential document on the strategic lessons of the Russo-Japanese War for the Admiralty. And he condemned the German fashion of writing massive tactical compilations, which he said was un-English and not useful, and he argued for a completely different, more strategically focused approach. Uh, this was particularly appropriate to a civilian author. One of the key things about Corbett's work was the way in which events on land and sea were integrated and his ability to explain how the great moments of naval history had to be worked for. Uh, and I quote from the Seven Years' War, it must not be forgotten that convenient opportunities of winning a battle, and he meant a naval battle, do not always occur when they are wanted. The dramatic moments of naval strategy have to be worked for, and the first preoccupation of the fleet will almost always be to bring them about by interference with the enemy's military and diplomatic arrangements. It was the ability of the Navy to interfere with what the enemy was doing on land, not its ability to achieve anything at sea that was really important. Those of his contemporaries who thought that a naval battle was in any way consequential uh, were in for a uh, rude awakening. Corbett did not believe that naval battles were consequential. They were the consequence of events on land. In volume one, he explained how the British had won the First World War. Um, in the book, chapter I wrote for Jonathan, um, I pointed out that the last naval battle of the First World War happened in March 1915 on the island of Juan Fernandez, now known as Robinson Crusoe's Island, when the last of Admiral von Spee's cruisers was sunk. From that point on, it's a very superior European war in which the Entente powers have access to the world and the Central powers do not. In volume two, he explained how the Dardanelles operation began and he explained what went wrong. And here his problem was quite simple. He approved of the con concept and the nature of such operations but he did not approve of the haphazard and careless way in which this particular operation had been organized and developed. And so he had to tread a very fine line between saying this was ridiculous, which was an easy thing to say, and saying this was actually a very good idea, which was very badly executed. And it was at this point that you can see the fractures with uh, Churchill. And he also had to deal with the role of Admiral Sir John Fisher, who for many years had been his closest contact in the Navy, and he had to explain what Fisher was doing at the Dardanelles. And the simple answer to that was not what anybody thought, as we will see. Critically, in Volume 3, Corbett had to explain the evacuation from the Dardanelles, the Gallipoli evacuations, and the failure to achieve decisive victory at the Battle of Jutland. His contribution to, the, to this history ends on the morning after the Battle of Jutland. Having finished that section of the book, volume three, he died very suddenly and left the book in rather lesser hands, which has gravely damaged its understanding and its reception. So Corbett works on this project all the way through the First World War. Really from the first days of the war, he's collecting evidence and beginning the process of shaping an official history. He has critical allies here, Vice Admiral Sir Edmund Slade, who's called back onto the Admiralty staff is somebody he's worked with for more than a decade. Slade, as you know, is the man who was heavily involved in getting BP set up to secure the Admiralty's oil supplies. Corbett and Slade are very close intellectually. Uh, they're both students of strategy and of Clausewitz in particular. Uh, his relationship with Hankey as the secretary of the CID is increasingly important, and he gets a lot from Hankey by writing Hankey's memoranda for him. Uh, all the really good Hankey stuff is Corbett, um, but in the Supreme Command, there's a wonderful entry in the index. It says, Sir Julian Corbett, a historian who worked for me. 
And if you, your opinion of Hanke is not lowered by that, you've missed the point. <laughs> the historical subcommittee of the Committee of Imperial Defense, Corbett didn't work for the Admiralty, he worked for the CID, and this is critically important, <coughs> set up a two-work, a two two-volume history of the Army and the Navy's contributions to the war. Corbett, as the only civilian on the body, made sure that the naval colonial and military operations were divided in such a way as to give the grand strategy to him. He would impose the pattern, and the army historian, initially John Fortescue, who'd been approved by Lord Kitchener, uh, would be left merely to deal with the tactical mess on the Western Front. Uh, and he would do so under the overarching direction of Corbett. The Treasury refused to pay for it, so Corbett wrote a fantastic memorandum which ended with a brilliant piece where he says, for the cost of 315 in shells, the nation would lose the useful services of the section as an educational center, as well as the actual history. I quote, hundreds of millions are spent on the war, and yet a few thousands are grudged to enable the state and the services to benefit by its experiences. For history is the memory of the services, and without it, the lessons will be forgotten alike by statesmen, sailors, and soldiers. Hanke signed that, and it worked. Once again, Hanke took ownership, but it was Corbett's memorandum. Corbett believed the role of official history was to develop future doctrine. Uh, he used the phrase, the soul of warfare, to describe what doctrine actually was. And eventually, everything was signed up in March 1916. And Corbett cleverly made sure that the publishers would not be HMSO, it would be Longmans, who were his normal London publisher with whom he had a long-standing relationship dating back to 1898. The decision was made public on the 28th of June, 1916, and naval operations would record the higher direction of a British war effort, emphasizing, and I quote, the deflection of strategy by politics. Corbett always made the point that strategy, whatever it is, is an art conditional upon everything else. This is something he's developed from Clausewitz. The model was expressly that of his text, England in the Seven Years' War. In fact, Corbett only ever wrote two great books, England in the Seven Years' War, which he repeated several times, and Some Principles of Maritime Strategy, uh, which is the opposite cut uh, of that evidence. Corbett, having established a model for a text dealing with the, the history of strategy, uh, never uh, shifted that model. He just replaced the evidence. Didn't even replace the conclusions, necessarily. The First World War was going to provide Corbett with two things, an opportunity to discuss what British strategy is, and then to revise and overhaul some principles as national strategic doctrine. And you can actually see him beginning to think about this during and after the war. Of course, he never got around to doing it. Ultimately, the new book would refresh and reinforce lessons derived from the Age of Sail. And it was that interface between what we had learned and what we had now learned all over again that will be critically important. Corbett's text had an important public information role, not the one of telling people what had happened, that was relatively uh, publicly known, but it was to provide for his core concept, and I quote, showing influence of fleet on war and prevent army from getting out of focus, to keep navy paramount. Uh, that's a diary entry, hence it's not as grammatical as his text. Placing the strategic narrative in the naval volumes would ensure the continental impression created by the sheer scale of military effort did not distort post-war national strategy. And remember that strategy is imperial, it's not European. Corbett is also heavily engaged as a liberal imperialist on reforming the British Empire into a sea commonwealth linked by the sea of home-ruling quasi-independent states, which are bound together by interest, not by power. This is another theme that emerges in his work and around his work. Initially, he, provides, he creates a running record using the material he has access to. He doesn't have access to everything. Some of the Room 40 material and some of the papers relating to the Grand Fleet are kept back until the war is actually finished. And as a result, he's not able to finish the volumes, although he's got them largely drafted by the time the war actually ends. As the war goes on, he increasingly realizes he faces two grave dangers to his sense of what Britain is and what British strategy should be. One of them, of course, is the British Army, which is wandering off at a dangerous tangent. And the other one is Woodrow Wilson. Uh, the Germans are not actually much of a problem. 
Uh, they've already been restrained to Europe, and they cannot win this war uh, without something fairly seismic happening. By 1916, Corbett is more concerned about Woodrow Wilson than he is about the Kaiser, uh, and rightly so. Woodrow Wilson is the greatest enemy of British sea power in the first half of the 20th century. The position papers that the British government uses at the Paris Peace Conference to get rid of Woodrow Wilson's freedom of the seas, point, the second of the 14 points, were all drafted by Corbett. They followed on from a long run of impressive high-end propaganda pieces he'd written during the war for the British government uh, and for Lancaster House. Wilson was forced to back down, largely, of course, by domestic problems. So Corbett is writing an important text which will be critical to the restructuring of the British Empire after the war. When John Jellicoe set off on his empire mission to reconstruct national imperial strategy post-war, he delayed sailing until he had a proof copy of volume one of Corbett's naval operations because, as he said, he did not know what had occurred in the outer seas while he was commander-in-chief Grand Fleet. Proof copies were rushed down to Portsmouth for the New Zealand to sail, one for Jellicoe and one for his chief of staff, Frederick Dreyer. And if you read the Jellicoe report, you'll see a lot of Corbett in it. That isn't Jellicoe, that's Corbett. Uh, this is the text that dominates that. Um, Jellicoe's response may have been slightly more heavy-handed than Corbett's, but it was certainly consistent. Volume two of the official history ended with the dramatic departure of Fisher and Churchill, the most dynamic and strategically lively partnership <coughs> that would be at the Admiralty in the wartime period. At a time when the army was locked into the Western Front and it left the Navy entangled in what was now a, the Gallipoli campaign, an army operation supported by the Navy rather than a naval operation supported by the army. And this was the consequence of a series of strategic blunders that had wrecked the combined concept at the heart of Corbett's concept of national strategy, leached away vital specialist assets from the primary maritime strategic targets, uh, and destroyed the expressly stated strategy of the first sea lord, Sir John Fisher. Fisher's strategy was not to get engaged on the Western Front. It was to clear the Belgian coast and to set up a decisive operation leading to the to the British having either access to or threatening to have access to the Baltic and completing economic warfare against Germany. Uh, Fisher had been thinking this for at least 15 years. Fisher had long believed that the Baltic was the key to defeating Germany and Corbett agreed with him. There is a wonderful passage in the Seven Years War book about the Baltic and Fisher used it in January 1915 to secure extra funding from the Treasury to build specialist warships for Baltic operations he sent the pages to David Lloyd George and asked him to read them. By return, Lloyd George sanctioned several millions being spent on some very unique warships behind the back of the First Lord of the Admiralty, who didn't approve. By 1920, Fisher was dead, and Corbett was working with George Lambert MP, former Civil Lord of the Admiralty and the executor of Fisher's literary estate. He invited Corbett to write Fisher's biography. Corbett was in no position to do this because he was very busy, but one wonders what effect Corbett's version of Fisher's career would have had on his subsequent reputation. Uh, I would argue that Fisher would stand far higher in the national pantheon than he does had he been read and understood by somebody who really could deal with major strategic concepts rather than Reginald Bacon, who was, after all, a technologist rather than a strategist. Corbett began writing Volume 3, which is what I'm going to concentrate on, and particularly on Jutland, after the war ended. The Cabinet came close to abandoning the whole project. Corbett was kept on tenterhooks for at least six months while the Cabinet debated whether to even publish. And when they did, they published his volume and waited to see if anybody bothered to notice. Uh, if nobody had said anything, they might have cancelled the project even then. It was the success of Naval Operations 1 that secured the publication of other volumes. So he is leading the charge to get this work. Returning to work after major surgery on May 31st, 1920, he had stones in his bladder. He was a man working himself to death and he would die of heart failure in September 1922. Corbett told his old friend Henry Newbold, I quote, I mean it to be my book, not the Admiralty's or anyone else's. I find it fairly easy to employ my opinion to rewrite and telling the story without saying anything that is likely to cause obstruction. 
Uh, that last claim may have been overly optimistic, but certainly Corbett is a brilliant writer of subtle innuendo. Uh, he was a lawyer by training, and his ability to get something clever past stupid, busy men uh, was legendary. Corbett located the failure at Gallipoli in the politics of grand strategy, the weakness of Russia, and the obstructionism of the, both the French and the British army. As a consequence, Britain ended up fighting the wrong war at the wrong time in the wrong place and giving way to French demands to send troops to Salonika, uh, which was the most futile waste of time. Uh, even the Germans thought it was a good idea that the British army went to Salonika, so it must have been. Um, the sound of slightly forced analysis reinforced by stressing the synergy between the Western Front views of the French and the British general staff as a block on the development of maritime strategic thought. He implied that had Britain been acting under effective political direction, as it had in the Seven Years' War, it would have employed a maritime expeditionary strategy and upheld the national interest against the demand of temporary, and he used that word temporary, allies. Indeed, Corbett openly admired the ruthless way in which British statesmen of the 18th century had abandoned allies as necessary to secure national aims. He thought Asquith and company were far too concerned about the opinion of the French. Corbett liked the French. Um, he hated the Germans, but he wasn't prepared to sacrifice the national interest uh, to those of a foreign state. We don't know in detail what Corbett was going to make of the outcome of the Battle of Jutland, because he died having finished the battle. But on October the 11th, 1921, he delivered a lecture on the British Navy after Trafalgar, uh, which is a perfect allegory for what he was going to do. He delivered it to an audience uh, at King's College London, as he usually did, that included the First Lord of the Admiralty and several members of the naval staff. He knew that Jutland was a contested battle and that it was causing friction within the fleet, largely for tactical reasons. And he would use this lecture to set out his view that the Battle of Trafalgar gave Britain no more value than the Battle of Jutland. The British began both battles with command of the sea. They ended both battles with command of the sea. There was nothing else to be said. The minor tactical detail that incompetent but brave French and Spanish ships were easily defeated, while skilled professional Germans were not, uh, should not obscure the strategic reality. Jutland became increasingly contentious from 1919 when Rosslyn Weems, first sea lord, commissioned a navigational history of the battle to deal with who had done what, when, and why. John Harper, master navigator, produced a brilliant resume of how the battle was fought and pointed up some fundamental errors made by one of the flag officers, Sir David Beatty. Now, these <coughs> mistakes are well known to all. Uh, impetuosity, poor signaling, poor gunnery, poor handling of ammunition, poor reporting, <coughs> and blundering across the front of Jellicoe's battle line at a critical moment. Beatty, who took over from Weems shortly after this manuscript appeared, blocked its publication on the grounds that it it would have damaged his political standing in a battle with the Treasury over the post-war estimates. Let's give Beatty his due. This isn't personal vanity. This is about the interests of the service. He has to be the hero of Jutland to defeat Churchill, who is increasingly effective as Chancellor of the Exchequer. Beatty asked Harper to change his verdicts. Harper said, only on a written order, sir, and that written order never came. He then invited Corbett to write an introduction which would sort of explain away the failures. He actually pulled Corbett back from a family holiday, very rare event. Corbett comes back to find out what's wanted, and he confides to his diary, I quote, they wanted me to write a forward to Jutland report to explain how good our gunnery was and only failed through bad shells against, against good armor. Mean to get out of doing it if I can. And he did. <laughs> Without missing a beat, Corbett reverted to his legal background. He advised Longmans that this would breach their contract to be the first people to publish an officially sourced account of the Battle of Jutland in England. Longmans wrote a letter. Corbett redrafted it into official terms, and the Admiralty backed down. Uh, Admiralty Secretary Oswin Murray, who was a long-standing friend and the treasurer of the Navy Records Society, I quote, jumped at the idea that Longman's position might provide an occasion for dropping the whole thing and handing it all over to me. So Corbett is already inside the machine working to stop this thing being published in the form that Beatty wants. Jellicoe is also protesting. Harper's report was never published in its original form. It was bowdlerized uh, and appeared sometime after Corbett's account. So the Admiralty Secretary is actually quite pleased to see the end of this. 
And in June 1921, Corbett settled that Jutland would be the end of Volume 3, and he would use Harper's material to make sure that he got the actual tactical detail correct. He was also in close contact with Jellicoe, who was reading and approving his drafts as he went. And having read Jellicoe's book, The Grand Fleet, uh, he was very much on Jellicoe's side of that argument. Beatty, defeated by Harper and Corbett, then went away and ordered a staff appreciation written by the brothers Kenneth and Alfred Dewar, naval officers of a quasi-intellectual bent. This staff appreciation was designed to counter what Harper had written. It turned out to be anything but a counter. Kenneth Dewar long, had long believed in a tactical system based on divisional principles and independent initiative, and he imposed that on the Battle of Jutland to argue that Jellicoe had made a mess of it. Dewar's draft was complete by September 1921. Corbett was well aware of this because they were using the same materials and often working in the same building and using the same cartographer. When it arrived, Alfred Chatfield, Beatty's flag captain at Jutland, but then assistant chief of the naval staff, demanded revisions to tone down the severe criticisms of Jellicoe. Eventually, 100 copies were printed as confidential book 0938 in December 1921. The staff appreciation is a controversial and hugely poisonous document, uh, which would have split the Navy down the middle into battlecruiser and Grand Fleet factions. And it was for this reason that Corbett ended his lecture on the British Navy in Trafalgar on October the 10th, 1921, with that discussion in which he said that Trafalgar mattered no more than Jutland. Dewar, having been at the lecture, then added something to the end of his volume where he says, and I quote as a direct response, quote, it has been said that a great victory would have given us no more than we had. This is a lame commentary on the battle. Uh, it is not only a repudiation of the teachings of Nelson and Mahan, but it involves an entire misconception of the subsequent workings of the submarine campaign and reduces contemporary British strategy to the level of a farce. It is better to look facts in the face. The Battle of Jutland can only be regarded as the beginning of a great battle which was never driven home. By studying its history, we may redeem our shortcomings and discover another sounder conception of tactics and command. Dewar was using this to pedal his own bicycle. He was not serving the interests of the Navy, but repudiating Corbett uh, was a fairly obvious thing to do. Eventually, Beatty decided to send out a version of Dewar's text, expurgated of all the really nasty stuff, uh, as a manual for the fleet, and he got a cartographer, Commander John Pollan, to revise it. What he ended up doing, on Corbett's advice, was taking out three chapters, which were particularly controversial, including the one that had all the Room 40 material in it. So the staff appreciation devenomized is, in fact, room lacks any serious contribution to the debate. It's a pretty banal document. Why was the volume not published in its original form? Because Corbett once again pulled the legal card and Longman's right not to be preempted. Corbett wrote the Battle of Jutland in 1922. It was the last major piece of writing that he began. And he worked it through fairly consistently in five phases, starting with the battle cruiser action and ending with the night battle. <coughs> he broke off in the middle of 1920, in, uh, 1922 to revise his material on the Gallipoli evacuations and then after May he was correcting Jutland and getting back to the last stages of the battle. At this point something very interesting happens. We often need to know about the drivers for the writing of books. In the middle of 1921, Corbett and his brother, who ran the family estate, were in discussion about selling a small part of their London property portfolio. They were offered a quarter of a million pounds for a street in the city of London, and they turned it down because they didn't need the money. Corbett did not write for the money. He could have walked away from this without ever worrying about it. He was an extremely wealthy man who did it because he absolutely believed that this was his job, his duty. He went to one of those public schools that imbued young men with a sense of duty, and that sense never left him to the very day he died. As he worked through the material, his judgment between Jellico and Beatty was increasingly on Jellico's side, and he worked the evidence pretty hard. Uh, getting hands on the secret report on gunnery, he realized just how bad the gunnery of the battlecruiser fleet was, and re-emphasized that point. <coughs> 
even though he knew that this would be controversial with a board of admiralty dominated by men from the battle cruiser fleet. He also asked Jellicoe if he'd ever thought about what routes Shear might have taken to go home. This was by far the best question anybody asked Jellicoe. Jellicoe didn't answer. It turns out Jellicoe had no intention of going to the Horns Reef the way Shear went home because he knew it would be an ambush. Hmm. On September 20th, 1922, Corbett was down at his country house at, uh, in West Sussex and he wrote in his diary a typical Corbett comment, a lovely day. Two days later, he was dead. Uh, Colonel Edward Daniel, who ran the CID, um, undertook to ensure that his tax was, I quote, not interfered with in any way after it has left this office, but I anticipate considerable trouble with the present Board of Admiralty over certain passages. Daniel knew exactly what was coming. He was a Royal Marine, so he's, he was used to rather obstreperous admirals. Later, Beatty tried to alter the text in proof. In 1923, the actual docket with the page proofs of the Jutland section still in the original folder, are in Beatty's private papers. He took them home and wrote on them. Then he got Chatfield to write on them, and then he f found out that he couldn't make the CID change it. So Beatty marginalia in the first Sea Lord's green ink all over <coughs> Corbett. Mostly saying things like, not true. <laughs> he couldn't actually repudiate Corbett, he could just assert. So... Corbett produced a strategic overview of the campaign in home waters to illustrate why Gallipoli mattered, what it had done to British strategy, and why when the, the campaign begins in the summer of 1916, uh, the Grand Fleet is merely a naval force. Jutland is a battle between two naval forces. It's a naval strategic event, and therefore in Corbett's terms, a matter of rather minor concern. Uh, only a joint strategic operation could have generated serious results. The implication that Corbett makes is that had Jellicoe steamed into the, into the Skagerrak with a fleet of transports carrying an expeditionary army to land on the Danish islands, uh, and I remind you that the key parts of Denmark are insular, not continental, and had been held by British troops in 1807, point Corbett made more than once, uh, the Germans would not have turned and fled. They would have fought the battle to a finish, and they would almost certainly have been sunk. But the reason why this had all failed is because British strategy had fallen into the hands of people who thought fighting the Germans as near to Germany as possible, using German methods, was an intelligent way of waging a British war. Uh, these people had allowed their doctrinaire considerations to take precedence over their intellectual understanding. Uh, it was a catastrophic mistake, and it was Corbett's job to point it out. And being a skillful advocate, he made sure that most of the witnesses for the prosecution were not British naval officers or indeed a British strategic writer, they were Germans. He quotes extensively from the memoirs of Tirpitz, of Scheer and Falkenhayn and Kurt Helfrich to illustrate just how fatuous British strategy had been and how the giving up of offensives uh, and the failure to grasp <coughs> the real prizes had given Germany great advantages. As these things came off the press, Corbett was working them very hard. Uh, he had to work Tirpitz's memoirs into volume one retrospectively. He began the build-up of Jutland with the dawning realisation in Britain that the failure at Gallipoli meant something had to be done to force the Germans to shift their focus to the north. And this meant, and I quote, reviving Fisher's stillborn plan for Baltic operations and seizing any opportunity, again, I quote, to upset the German war plans by forcing them to dissipate forces for the defence of their northern front, uh, i.e. getting into the Baltic and operating in conjunction with the Russians, not the Russian army, but the Russian navy. It was Fischer's expectation, and Corbett agreed, that if the Germans violated the neutrality of Denmark, like they had that of Belgium, serious consequences would ensue in their relations with the other Scandinavian states, notably Sweden, and that this would have a great and beneficial effect on British relations with the United States. Fischer's special fleet, the things that he persuaded Lloyd George to fund, uh, a year before, were ready for operation. They just needed an amphibious strike force. That British expeditionary force that Haldane had created for expeditionary operations, not for continental mass deployment. Consequently, in May 1916, Jellicoe developed a plan to send a cruiser squadron all the way down to Copenhagen. The intention was to provoke the Germans to do something rash, and 
Like Fischer, he, Jellicoe had finally come to realize that this was the only way of getting the Germans to operate. If the Germans intervened, there was every possibility that the Danes would open their ports and accept British support for the defense of their country, at least the insular parts thereof. Sending this cruiser squadron would be a bait to lure out Scheer's fleet and hopefully force a battle somewhere in the Kattegat or the Skagerrak. Jellicoe also set a trap for the Germans, consisting of a submarine ambush and minefields. Scheer did exactly the same. And as Scheer raised steam before Jellicoe did, Jellicoe was en ended up responding to Scheer's plan, not conducting his own. Both sides needed a big victory in the summer of 1916 because nothing else was actually happening. This isn't a good time to be thinking about winning the war. The problem is that the British expectation of a new Trafalgar would inevitably be disappointed because the Germans were not the French and the Jutland Peninsula is not Cape Trafalgar. Corbett stressed that Jellicoe's primary role, the support of the blockade, meant that his base at Scapa was too far north for extensive operations in the wet triangle around the Heligoland Bight area where a decisive battle would probably be fought. And he contrasted Jellicoe's position with that of Nelson, emphasizing there were major differences. The critical one, of course, is that Nelson never commanded the main British fleet. The fleet that fought at Trafalgar was the offcuts of a much more important fleet that was blockading the main enemy force. Villeneuve, too, did not command the main French fleet. Corbett did not pull his punches when it came to criticizing the performance of the battle cruiser phase of the action. Uh, their gunnery was appalling, uh, Beatty's signaling procedure was very poor, and this was all shown up by the magnificent handling of the 5th Battle Squadron by Hugh Evan Thomas, uh, which saved Beatty and inflicted serious punishment on the enemy. He pointed out that Lyon had conducted a 360 degree turn at the height of the gunnery action, something Beatty strenuously denied, but it's in her chart book, uh, so it actually did happen, and that this took seven full minutes to complete. Uh, this really was a, a catastrophic failure of judgment on his part. Corbett always strayed just this side of overt judgment. It's implicit. But as his audience is serving naval officers, they don't need any help to understand that doing a 360 in the middle of a battle is remarkably poor form. Jellicoe emerges as a paragon of command, and he's put in the pantheon of post-war admirals. Uh, he's named in the same sentence as Admiral Sir Arthur Wilson, the greatest of all the pre-Dreadnought era fleet commanders, who was his mentor. Jellicoe was the commander on Wilson's last battleship command. So those two men are very close. He also makes a parallel with the glorious 1st of June, uh, which would have been another glorious 1st of June had Jellicoe been in the right place the morning after the battle, uh, just to emphasize that Jellicoe, like Howe, had got between the enemy and their base. He had outmaneuvered them and forced them to fight, only to lose them through inconsequential uh, blunders by juniors. He also stressed how seriously the destroyer formations had failed in the night action and pinpointed one individual in particular who'd opened a gap in Jellicoe's line through which the Germans had steered. Not only was Jellicoe excused, but post-war naval course, war course students would understand that destroyer flotillas could not be relied on to stop battle fleets at night. Uh, That's quite a serious point. Finally, Corbett gave the Germans agency. They were a skilled and effective enemy. They were unit for unit equal. Uh, earlier in the book, he'd credited, the, and I quote, the skill and boldness of Lieutenant Commander Otto Hersing in U-21, who sank two British battleships off the globally beachheads. And he talked of the skill and boldness of Scheer, which gave him the opportunity to get home after doing enough for honor. And he, met, he pointed out that Scheer had been very effective. He also stressed that decisive victory had not been a proper or indeed a necessary ob objective for Jellicoe. Jellicoe's job was to maintain command of the sea. It was, if he could sink the Germans, so much the better. But that was a secondary, not a primary aim. The cause of the failure of war strategy down to 1916 were ultimately the disengagement between military and naval operations. In the Seven Years' War, he stressed that the victory at Quebec set up the decisive naval battle at Quiberon. Deprived of their empire and their overseas communications, the French had nothing to left to chance but to risk an invasion of the British mainland, and the fleet they assembled for that was encountered and destroyed by Lord Hawke in the Kiberon Bay. Uh, without an equivalent threat to Germany's vital interests, there was no reason for them to send their fleet out. 
Their fleet was a powerful political tool, remaining singly in harbour, doing nothing. Of course, the consequence of that was the sailors mutinied and brought down the German Empire, but that's a secondary story which <laughs> Corbett didn't get to tell. So Corbett never loses sight of Fisher's vision of how the war should have been fought, and had he lived to finish the book, that would have been the ultimate wrap-up. We actually had the ideas written out in full to win this war the proper British way, and because of the failure of political leadership, we did not do this. Corbett knew they'd been written out properly because he'd written them out uh, at Fisher's dictation. Uh, the work of these two men in early 1915 is really quite striking. Corbett's book is published in 1923, and before it comes out, Beatty, having failed to change it and to censor it, inserts in it a passage at the very front on the page opposite the title page, and it says, their lordships find that some of the principles advocated in this book, especially the tendency to minimize the importance of seeking battle and of forcing it to a conclusion, are directly in conflict with their views. This minute was written by Roger Keyes, uh, with grammatical help from Winston Churchill. <laughs> I always liked Keyes, the Duracell bunny of the Dardanelles. Um, anxious to avoid anything that might harm their sales, Longman's, Corbett's long-serving publishers, neatly hid this behind a diagram of Jellicoe's deployment on the port column, an image that emphasized the scale and power of the Grand Fleet and Jellicoe's absolute victory over the enemy. Uh, nobody ever notices this unless they look for it. When you open the title page, there's the chart, there's the title page, and the repudiation is on the back. But what Beatty had done was catastrophic. By publicly disassociating the service from a book consciously crafted to enhance public appreciation of the Navy's role in winning the war, the Admiralty collectively shot itself in the foot. In his defense, Beatty was waging a war with the Treasury and really couldn't afford to be shown up as a complete duffer. So he had to do this to serve his political position. It's worth noting when he retired from the Admiralty in 1927, he ceased to claim any such thing. He simply went very quiet, and he literally killed himself by attending Jellicoe's funeral. Uh, Beatty was a, one of Jellicoe's admirals at the Battle of Jutland, but when he was first sea lord, he had to be something different. But that was not what he believed. That was what was politically necessary. Jellicoe, by contrast, wrote, and I quote, I find it difficult to express my admiration for the style of the narrative, the language in which it is expressed, and its accuracy. And I think we have to give Jellicoe the last word there. Naval Operations was written to support post-war naval education and the development of doctrine, to connect the world war with past practice, and above all, to rescue national strategy from the lazy assumption that the only way to fight Germany had been to copy the German approach to war, mass armies, decisive battle on land. The next time Britain went to war, it ended up waging Corbettian war for 18 months against a major European coalition in a phase of the war that echoed very clearly those of the Napoleonic Wars when Britain alone fought against the French dictator. Britain did this not because it was clever, but because it had no choice. And in 1916, had the French thrown in the towel, they would again have had no choice. Would they have been successful? Probably. Uh, Corbett is quite clear on this. This was not dissimilar to past precedent. In both cases, the British ended up on the winning side, not because they defeated the enemy, but because the enemy overreached themselves. What the Germans did in the Second World War, what the, Russia, what the French did in 19, 1812, is to pick on somebody they can't w defeat and to give the British uh, an open opportunity. Corbett's text laid out the underlying strategic concepts with compelling clarity, along with his judgment that Fisher, and Fisher alone, had the ability and the vision to create a coherent grand strategy consistent with British experience that would exploit the emerging strategic opportunities. <coughs> he used Jutland to demonstrate that the effective development of British strategy depended on the combined action of Navy and Army, that decisive naval battles were set up by the effective use of military force, and that unless an enemy had been compelled to fight to the finish in defense of higher, that is, grand strategic interests, it was unlikely that any naval combat would have significant strategic impact. Furthermore, victory in naval battle was remarkably unimportant as long as, Britain, <clears throat> as long as Britain retained sea control. On those grounds, he had publicly declared Jutland served the British as well as Trafalgar. He did not live to complete the official version of that argument or to bring his deep engagement with the decisive quality of commanding the Baltic to a resolution. That task fell to Henry Newbolt. And Henry Newbolt was a fine poet. 
Naval Operations signposted his conclusions and supplemented by his other publications, his correspondence and diaries, provides ample evidence that this was a question of higher strategic <coughs> purpose. Thank you very much. Thank you.